Hey, Bethany. How you doing? Is this thing on? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, hey, my name is Ryan Buss, and I'm, I'm filling in for Pastor David this week as he uh, was he got tired out by our middle school kids running middle school camp, so, so you're stuck with me. Um, but it's an awesome privilege to be here today and just to gather together and worship the God of the universe here on Canby. We're just one speck on this earth, but God hears our praises when we lift them up. Um, our call to worship today is Psalm 145, which was written by King David. Uh, it's a beautiful psalm that captures the heart of King David, the heart King David had for God. Um, we say these words to the same God today. Um, the, the God of King David, the God of Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of the 12 disciples, and the God of Bethany Church today. So if you'd stand with me, we're going we're gonna, to um, recite uh, Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and I shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all he has made. Presence is 
All our fears are washed away Cause when we see you We find the strength to face the day In your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away oh. happen or is this I think maybe that was real <laughs> that's just the guitarist way you can ask my wife <laughs> Tongues to see my great redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. My gracious master and my God assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of There is one 
during this time of worship, I wanted to just read, uh, I think it's Colossians 3.16. I, I, <laughs> I didn't write it down. Um, but it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness to our heart, in our hearts to God. And I just want to just encourage everybody just to, to you know, use this time of worship just to be thankful for what God has done for us. song, Our Sins, They Are Many, His Mercy Is More, but I wonder how many of us really believe that. And I mean believe it more than we sing it or say it or in our mind, but live that way out of our heart. Uh, our sins, they are many, but His mercy is more. That means that this morning, He just wants you to come. He just wants you to be here. It means you don't have to clean up your act before you can come to Jesus or come to church to gather with his people because his mercy is more than your sins. If it was flipped the other way around, we'd have a different story, wouldn't we? His mercy is more than whatever you're going through today, whatever you're feeling today, or maybe however you slipped up, messed up, sinned this weekend. His mercy is more and fresh this morning. Let's continue to worship in prayer. Then I'll give you an official welcome. <laughs> Let's pray. Christ Jesus, we come to you today in our series as the great high priest, the one true high priest. We want to see that today in Hebrews 5 in our Heart of Jesus series. Lord, we ask you today to do that, to work in your word, in our hearts, as Ryan just read to us, to hear it, to contemplate it, to focus on it, to let us transform it. As high priest Jesus, you've gone before us You've opened a way up for us to follow. 
Because you're our high priest, we're able to enter into the presence of the Father so differently than the Old Testament saints did and would have desired to do. And even differently than Adam and Eve did. Thank you for coming to earth and experiencing, Jesus, the temptation that we've experienced that's common to men and women. And suffering with suffering that's common to men and women and children. Far more than we experienced even so that you could intercede, be that high priest for us. We ask you, a high priest, to do that. To continue to intercede before us as we bring requests to you this morning, the throne of grace. We pray, Lord, for a moment for a few in our community. Specifically, we pray for those who are battling cancer this morning. For Donna DeConing, for Debbie Gunther, for Carol Brisky, others in our congregation as well that might be fighting cancer. We ask, Lord, this morning, if maybe they're watching at home online, that you would give them perseverance, give them strength, give them comfort, give them assurance of your presence, Lord. And we ask for health for them. Whatever that might look like, even if it's not exactly how they would define it. Lord, we pray for those in our community this morning who are continuing to grieve. We pray this morning for Jan Jones and her family as they'll host a service at their house this weekend for John. May you comfort them, watch over them, give them strength as they do grieve, and may your word be shed abroad upon the hearts that are there. We thank you for our church family, Lord. We thank you for the families in our church. We pray for our children this morning. Kids, can you hear me? We pray for our kids this morning that you would watch over them and keep them, that you would draw them to yourself and show them your love, Jesus. Show them even in their young hearts their need of a Savior, not in a shameful way that, um, that harms them or hurts them, but in a way that lifts them up in joy to you, Jesus. May they hear of your gospel today in their classes. Bless their teachers and helpers. Thank you so much for them. We pray for the world today. It's sort of dropped off the radar, but there's still a war going on between Ukraine and Russia. And countless that are, home, are uh, refugees now in other countries. Those that are still grieving the loss of fathers, sons, kids, wives, mothers, daughters, Lord. We ask you to bring peace to that area of the world. Lord, we thank you for our two youth camps these last couple weeks and what happened there. Bless the ongoing relationships and the word that was teach, taught there, Lord. Uh, may it continue to bear fruit. Thanks for Anna who taught this weekend to the junior high. Bless those lessons she taught. This morning as we close, we're most grateful as we talk about you, high priest, of our reconciliation to you, God, through the death of Christ, our, your son, our brother, we rejoice that he went to the cross for us, rose again, and now he intercedes still as high priest. Even in this moment, Jesus is interceding for all those in this room who trust him. So we plead our cause with you in our prayers this morning. It's in your name we pray, Christ. Amen. Well, welcome to Bethany Church. Now here's your official welcome. So glad you're here today, all of you. I'm, uh, I'm Jeff Jennings. I get the privilege to serve as your lead pastor. And to those of you watching online today, glad you're out there watching. We know there's a few of you out there today. Uh, we missed you today, but glad you can check in through technology and be with us and hear the word today. If you're new to Bethany Church today, there's something called Next Step Card. You see it on the screen behind me. It's in our chair back. We'd love for you to help us out by filling that out and then bringing it to the gathering place after the service and exchange it for a, a Bethany Church water bottle, which is a gift to you for being our guest today. Um, we're just glad you're here, and I'm glad everybody's here today as we get to come to Jesus as our high priest. A few things to announce today uh, to make your, uh, bring to your attention. We've got uh, our maybe second annual, I think it might be, uh, Bethany Kids. I just put you on the line for maybe more, but that's okay. Second, second, second uh, Bethany Kids and Family Back to School Barbecue at the Hortons Home, uh, Friday, September 2nd at 5.30 p.m. That's a time for families uh, and, uh, of our Bethany Kids Ministry to get together before the school year starts. Maybe we'll pray for each other that night, uh, let the kids play, bring a side dish to share. I think we'll probably have some burgers and hot dogs out there. Address is there. You don't need to RSVP. Just come on that uh, day. We'd love to see you there. We'll be there and uh, look forward to it. 
Also want to have you save the dates, more details to come on this, but uh, Anna Burnham, our women's discipleship director, wanted to get this in front of you. A day retreat, Saturday, September 24th, a local day retreat we're going to have called Stories of Faith. I think you're going to hear some testimonies, probably some messages from the Word, great food, fellowship, and time together. So save the date, Saturday, September 24th, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and we will have more details to come in the coming weeks. We just want to get it out there on your calendar. And finally, this morning, we are in need of a couple of volunteers. We really desire to uh, provide a um, really robust children's ministry, not just babysitting, but a, a message of the gospel uh, to our kids. And we're looking for some helpers one time a month, actually. We're not asking for two, three, four. One time a month, we need and a helper, not, a, not teachers, but helpers for our pre-K class one time a month and our fourth through sixth grade class one time a month. We really desire to continue uh, the full spectrum and scope of those grades in that ministry, and we're looking for some helpers to help out with that. If you're interested uh, and not even sure, just have a few questions, uh, email Katie Horton at candybethany.org. Uh, you see it there, K. Horton, actually. Okay, kids, speaking of children's ministry and your teachers and your helpers, you guys are dismissed to head to the back. We love you. We want you to learn of Christ today. Uh, be kind to your teachers. Listen well. <laughs> learn well and love well. Thanks, Jeff. So today we're going to try something a little different, but it's not, di not really that different. You've probably done this um, sometime in the past, but I was thinking when worshiping Jesus with our voices, we can hear the beauty of God's design and the differences we have between the way men's voices sound and the way women's voices sound. Um, they're both beautiful in different ways. But what I want to do, we're going to sing a song that you probably all know very well. It's Chris Tallman's song, How Great Is Our God. Um, and when we get to the bridge, we're going to sing it one time through, name above all names, worthy of all praise, together. And then the second time we sing it, as you can see on the slide above, we're, we're showing it so it doesn't, like, it is, looks different. But we're going to sing, uh, the men will continue to see the sing the bridge, and the women will sing the chorus. And we're going to sing it together over a top, on top of each other. So, um, uh, so when you see the slide up there, men will be the top. We're, we're singing those both at the same time. So the men will sing the top line, women will sing the, the, the bottom line, which is just the chorus. Um, let's see. Um, so up here, Lee and I, Lee and I are gonna lead the men, and then Sarah and Sydney are gonna lead the women. So, you, so men follow Lee and I, and women, you follow Sydney and Sarah. And I'm gonna give you guys a heads up. I'm not just gonna jump in without letting you guys know what's coming up. So I don't want to scare you any more than you probably already are. Uh, <laughs> but I think, I think it'll be fun. I think you've done it uh, in the past when you're, when you're a kid. But I think I just love sometimes pulling the voices apart, singing different things, just hearing them kind of harmonize together.
lion and the lamb. How great, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names all together. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing, how great is our God. Men, name above all names, women, how great is our God. together the chorus. How great is our God. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great again. How great time just voices how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God This morning we will read from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. We'll be reading about the high priest as he was in the Old Testament. So Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Alice. This summer we have been looking at the heart of Jesus not to excuse or dismiss what he did for us on the cross or to ignore his wonderful teaching that we have throughout the Gospels and the rest of the Bible, really, um, but because we want to know him. We want to know him deeply. That is the heart of the Christian faith, to know the heart of Jesus. It's how we grow in relationship with each other, to know the true self of another person. Pray with me this morning. Lord, Open your word now for us and to us. 
Give us an insight into the heart of Jesus and his role of the priest. Speak through me clearly. Take any words from me that wouldn't be from you, Lord. And we ask you to bless our time and grow us, change us through this message, we pray by the power of your spirit. Amen. So we've been answering questions like this in this series. What comes naturally from Jesus' heart to you, to repentant sinners? What defines Jesus' heart? What's his disposition towards people? And what is Jesus really like? What is he like? We ask, what is he like today? When we, often you hear this question when a, a family member of a famous person or celebrity is interviewed, what's he really like? What's he really like? What's she really like? And we ask because we assume the family members know him best. And you can't really know a famous person, a celebrity, or somebody you see on TV or in print or on screen from the outside. You can't truly know them. So we ask, what's he really like? So too, we as Jesus' family want to know him as he truly is from the inside, his heart. We're family on the inside. But I'm convinced that even many on the inside the family don't move past maybe a, a precursory understanding of who Jesus is in his heart. Do you want to grow? Do you want to change in ways? Do you want to become more like Jesus? Do you want to see success over the same old sins? Do you want to be someone who has inner peace, a ballast, a strength, a gentleness, a core sense of your identity that can't be rattled by painful and stressful situations? I know I do. I'm sure you do too. But you can't just do this by remaining on the periphery with Jesus, even if you know him. The disconnect between your walk and your talk is, is directly correlated to your connection to Jesus' heart. To truly know him is to become more like him. And today we're going to look again at the gentleness of Jesus. We learned in week one this from Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Is gentleness an attribute you aspire to? Think about that for a moment. Is gentleness with all those you come into contact with something you want to show or lead with it? Or how about this? Is it something that's promoted culturally in America or maybe in our state, in Oregon? Is it something that's promoted, gentleness? Well, today we'll see that the priests of the Old Testament were called to be gentle in heart towards the sinner as they made the sacrifice for sins. We're going to look at Jesus' high priestly role and see that it's one of a heart of gentleness towards sinners who come to him. And in turn, my hope is going to be to see that we too can exercise, can grow in, can lead with a gentle heart with others. And that doesn't mean passive doesn't actually even mean weak as we would define weak. Gentleness doesn't mean that. So grab your outline. Hopefully you got it there and you got your scripture open. As we're going to explore the heart of Jesus by looking at three truths. Our first truth begins way back in the history of God's people in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about the role of high priest. Here's our first truth. A priest did this. Represented the people, of, the people to God with gifts and sacrifices because he identified with them. So priests represented the people to God, you could say God to the people too, with gifts and sacrifices because he identified with them. The book of Hebrews, the entire point is to tell us what it means that Jesus is our great high priest, the final priest, the best priest, the one who would put an end to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. But that word priest doesn't make a lot of uh, a, a sense, a ton of sense to us as, as Protestants or in our day and age, the word priest. Maybe if you grew up Catholic, it has some sense of the pastor at the church there or the Eucharist. But overall, we don't live in a culture with much to say about priests and a lot of times much to say positively about priests. We've kind of lost the sense of what their role was. Well, verse 1 gives us one of the best definitions, I think, in all the Bible of what a priest does. Let me read it again. For every high priest, 
chosen from among men, is appointed to act on behalf of men, that'd be men and women, in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. I want to spend a little time, probably our most time, on point one today, because I think it's really important and it makes it really rich when we understand the high priest's role when we begin to describe Jesus as our high priest. And not only that, but that he's a gentle high priest. Gentle. In the ancient world, and not just the Israelites, but the ancient world, you would look at a temple and think of it as the place where the God, a God, resided. Kind of where they lived. The play, and the, the temple would be the place where humanity, a person, would come to interact with a God. It would be considered in the ancient world where heaven and earth intersect and come into contact. Heaven and earth overlapping and intersecting. Well, if you're the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, what is your temple? It's creation. It's everything. You're the one true God, and you've made this world, this universe, to be in and overlap and interact with humanity. You could call it maybe even like a cosmic temple where God resided and took up residence. The heavens declare the glory of God the Bible says, the sky, his handiwork. And Adam and Eve, those first humans, were placed inside this land, Eden, in this garden in Eden, and they were there interacting with God, and they kind of had a priest-like role. Adam and Eve, the first humans. They were the ones who would represent God to the earth, being made in his image. That's why there was no idols or images in God's temple. We are his image. Bearers. They would represent God to the earth being made in his image, and they would represent humanity, the earth, to God. They, Adam and Eve functioned in really priest-like kind of roles. Verse 1 says that the priest is there to act on behalf of men in relationship or relation to God. The priest links heaven and earth. It's a special role. It's an important role. And Adam and Eve, as those first priest-like human beings, were there to spread out from the garden. After passing, we would have hoped, that initial test at the tree, spread out from the garden in these priest-like roles to spread his glory all over the earth. So that the world would become this garden-like, beautiful place where heaven and earth overlap. The entire earth was to become a garden of God's presence. We, it's in the language. Be fruitful and multiply, spread out, work and watch over the earth, keep the evil out, keep God's word, make sure it's uh, pertained to and protected and, and shared. That's a priest-like function and role. And this is the first part of our point. Priests are mediators between God and man. They represent humanity to God as our first parents did. And this was God's original plan. He wanted to dwell with you. That's why he made a sanctuary of the cosmos, the heavens and earth. He wanted to dwell with you. He wanted to be with you. He wanted heaven and earth to overlap in this place, in fullness where they overlapped. This was Eden. This was this land called Eden. And inside this land called Eden, there was a garden, the garden of Eden. There was Eden, the area of land, but then there was the garden in the land. But then at the center of that garden, you remember what was at the center of the garden? There was that tree. That tree was found. The tree of life. The tree that would sustain Adam and Eve for eternal life. You could maybe even call it, kind of like the temple or tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. The center of that garden. But as we know, sin entered the world and Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. So their role changed. Their relationship changed. The overlapping of heaven and earth changed with sin. But, like the garden, God wanted to dwell with his people. It was the original intent. And so he created a new space where a priest could now interact with him safely. Because now they were sinful. But before they weren't. And he was holy. Access to God wasn't so safe anymore. Things had kind of changed. So he had them erect a tabernacle. Remember that in the Old Testament? Like a traveling tent. 
that went with them wherever they went. And it was even designed, if you read in Exodus and Leviticus, it was even designed with some features that would make the early Israelites think of the garden. Trees and plants and fruits. They would think of the garden. Now this is where God's presence would dwell most available, kind of as a hot spot for humanity. Here's a couple images that I got from BibleProject.com that I wanted us to see today. On the left, we've got the garden there, or something symbolizing it. And on the right, we've got something symbolizing the tabernacle, that traveling tent. And hopefully here we begin to see the importance of the overlap between that garden and that tabernacle and the priest and us being able to be in the presence of God. They were designed to show you how special God is and was at that time and how his relationship with you was special and needed care and tending by a priest. And the closer you get to the center of both of these, the more sacred the space becomes. This next slide we're coming up here, you see they both have an outer space, the little medium purple there. They both have an outer space there. There was a larger land outside the garden, but there was also the courtyard outside the tent of entrance and the holy of holies. Then our next slide. And inside that garden, inside that garden, uh, there was also uh, the Garden of Eden there. And inside that uh, garden, there was a tree. But also inside that tent, there was a holy of holies. We have another slide there. There it is. There it is. Sorry, I skipped. There was the garden inside the land of Eden, and then the tent of entrance inside the outer court. But then inside the center of both of those, we have the tree of life and the holy of holies. God's, the place of God's presence. There's an overlap there. There's a, a, a sense of holiness and sacredness as you go into the center of both those, the garden, the tree of life that would have them live forever, but also the place where God's presence was most clearly available, where the um, Ark of Covenant would be, where the priest would enter once a year. The tabernacle was there for, it was always meant to point back to the original Eden and the presence of God with his people. But here's the problem. While Adam and Eve could meet with God in his presence walking in the garden, now humanity needed a priest to enter the Holy of Holies for them. They couldn't do it on their own and make a sacrifice for their sin. It's gifts and sacrifices. That's how they identified. That's what the priest did. As a human being, the priest could identify with the people and make a gift of sacrifice for human sin because he too was a human. Only the priest can go into the holy place of the, uh, uh, in the tabernacle on behalf of others, and he'd be dressed in, in gold and jewels and white, the colors of white to represent the people. This person was called by God, verse 4 says in our text, like Aaron, but he also has to offer a sacrifice for himself too, and then for the people. Okay, so you might hear all this say, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, okay, there's some overlap and the, how they go towards the center of the tabernacle and the, and the, uh, the garden, but and that's kind of cool, but what does it have to do with my day-to-day -day life? <laughs> Why are we spending so much time on this? I think it actually has everything to do with your life. If God's purpose was to dwell with humanity in these two spaces and then the temple after that, to dwell with humanity in perfect peace, and yet that's been absolutely disrupted by our sin. How do we commune with him now? How does he view the idea of the priest and sinners and him being holy? How does he do it now? I mean, the tabernacle kept people at arm's length. Only the high priest got really close to God in that setting, in that space. It doesn't feel very accessible, and actually it was probably a little bit scary. They would wear, I think, a cord of bells so they, when they went in, they would know that they were still alive and if they needed to, <laughs> you know, he wasn't, hadn't done the sacrifice for himself. And Hebrews 10 also calls all those sacrifices and gifts and says they, they didn't really, truly, ultimately, eternally take away sins. They couldn't eternally pay for sinners. So what were they? What were those early sacrifices? I mean, they, were, they are strange. Apart from kind of hunting or purchasing our food at the grocery store and eating animals, we don't 
live in a world of animal sacrifice anymore. There are places that still do. We don't live in an animal sacrifice place. We would consume for food or hunt. So what were they? It's strange to us. Here's what they were. First, they were a loving provision by God to remind them first of the destructive nature of sin. In the slitting of the throat of the animal and the death of the animal and the spilling of the blood, you would be reminded sin is destructive. So they functioned as a deterrent, a reminder of the sinfulness of sin. But they also did function in a way, in a precursor, to keep relationship between God and his people. They acted as a, as a temporary cleansing and forgiveness as the punishment would be placed on the animal and also pointed them to their need of a greater sacrifice as sacrifices had to keep going and going and going and going. So they acted as a cleansing, a detergent, you might say. A deterrent and a detergent. Kind of the two, two words to help us understand what they were for. Deterrent and kind of like a cleansing detergent. So how important then was a priest if you needed those things? And relationship with God depended upon these things. Really important. Super important. And how important was it, be, uh, how what important was it that he be one who himself understood the plight of sinners in gentleness and sincerity of heart as he offered the sacrifice? Verse 2 tells us that in chapter 5. He should be gentle so that he can identify and understand the wayward, ignorant sinners. It wouldn't be good enough, in other words, for a priest to just go through the motions. They couldn't just go through the motions. All right, give me your animal. All right, next, next. They couldn't do that. At least they weren't supposed to. He must feel it. He must identify with the ones he was sacrificing for. And here's where we get to Jesus identifying with us. Jesus identifies with us as the high priest, we begin to make a a connection here. He has identified with you. Do you see why, as we talk a little about the Old Testament priesthood and the tabernacle and the the temple, why he needed to become human? Hebrews 5 helps us there. He he needed to become human because he was going to represent humanity. As the first Adam did, the first priest-like man, as he did, In his test at the garden, he represented humanity as he identified with them. Hebrews 7 says that as he represents you, he lives to constantly make intercession for you. Right now, right now, Jesus still functions in his priestly roles, making intercession. Those are your children, Father. These are the ones I died for. Well, he identified with us because he came. He was going to make a payment for humanity. He wasn't going to die for rocks, right? He didn't come as a tree. He didn't come as a drop of water or a bird. He came as a human. He didn't come as an angel. He didn't die for the angels, the angelic created beings. He died for humans. He became the link between heaven and earth. Cool, but in the Gospel of John, the beginning, it says he dwelt among men and women. You know, you probably heard this before. You know what that word is, right? He tabernacled amongst men and women. He's the link between heaven and earth, the true hot spot of God's presence, right? Jesus Christ, God in flesh. Hebrews 2.17 says about this identifying of Jesus, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters. He had to be made like us in every respect, so that he might become, become, he's going to grow into this, a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation, that's payment, that's absorbing God's wrath for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. In other words, the writer is saying, Jesus knew and still knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to be human. A true human heart true human experiences, true human suffering. And he identifies with us as an Old Testament priest would, but in a much better way, to pay for us. To pay for our sins. To represent us. But also, to comfort you. To comfort you with his heart. 
So what kind of priest is he? I don't know if he would look, would look at Aaron or some of those guys in their outfits of gold and jewels and all the breastplate and all the things they wore. Is that really approachable? I don't know. I mean, it's probably why pastors stop wearing suits. I mean, <laughs> do you want, we want to be approachable. I don't know if they would have been very approachable. Is he approachable? How does he look on sinners who approach him? Uh, and I mean, uh, you, let's say, I mean the, the sinners, the clear sinners, which is all of us. How does he look on us? Let's look at truth, too, to see how he deals with sinners who come to him. Jesus deals gently with all sinners who come to him. Why? Because he, too, experienced weakness and grew in his sympathy. Jesus identifies with us, and he knows suffering. But as Hebrews 4 and 5, they're really closely linked there, the, pa- the, the um, passage that Bob preached on a couple weeks ago, they're really closely linked, these verses. They make really clear that he's gentle, high priest. Look at verse 2 with me again of chapter 5. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Now, the human priest is being described here in verse 2, is described as being somebody who needs to deal gently with ignorant and wayward sinners. But there's a really clear connection here to chapter 4, verse 15, which I said Bob preached on a couple weeks back. A really close connection here. Here's uh, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Sympathize here in this verse is very similar language. In fact, it's kind of the same word as in chapter 5, verse 2, that says deal gently. It's pretty much a similar word. And it means feeling a sense of co-suffering with us or full solidarity with us. If you played team sports, there's something about that as children or into our youth of a solidarity with teammates. In fact, it's one of the great lessons that playing team sports teaches us. A solidarity, teamwork, togetherness. We're all in this together. If one wins, we all win. If one loses, we all lose. This idea of co-suffering, of sympathy, of dealing gently has that kind of mentality of being part of the team. He's one of us. In chapter 5, 2, that word is he deals gently. So here's what that means. When you come to Jesus with your sin in true repentance, he doesn't throw up his hands in frustration and turn his back on you. He doesn't begrudgingly begrudgingly say, here's one more who's messed up the plan or messed up his life or messed up her life. No, he's totally calm and tender and soothing. And the idea has the word of restraint, too, in it. He's restrained as he deals with with you and us. But what elicits this gentleness? What brings it out of Christ's heart? Because it's not just on all sinners in general. Gentleness doesn't come from Jesus to all sinners in general. If you're listening to me today, here or online, and hear my words and don't come to Jesus, you won't experience his gentleness. You won't experience his gentleness. Book of Revelation speaks of those who don't come to Christ, what they will one day experience. You know how it describes it? It's metaphorical. It's imagery. Not exactly sure, but it doesn't sound good. It's like a piercing, double-edged sword. That's how it describes it. Here's a couple. We need to see this because it's reality. And if you don't come to Christ, you won't experience his gentleness. Revelation says you'll experience this. Hear it as a warning. From his mouth, that's Jesus, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. In verse 21, that same chapter says, And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. It's not pleasant, is it? 
His gentleness is not for all. In fact, it says in the book of Revelation, it's, it's like this double-edged sword, and there's treading and, 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 and tramping, and, or tromping on, stepping on, and, and, and piercing, and it, it's, it's a horrible image. But if you come to him, as deep as the judgment is here for those who don't come to him, as deep as that is, just as deep as his gentle tenderness will be for all who come to him. All. And not just once over and over again with your sin and your repentance and your need of him. Here's the comfort for us. I know, I think we all know, I think you know, that each and every one of us in our life have had people who didn't deal gently with us. Every one of us. And that may kind of uh, trigger for you some thoughts even today or your history and past, but people who were cruel with our weaknesses, people who acted shocked when we failed or revealed some weakness, I can't believe you would do that. Maybe someone in your life who called you stupid, a failure, or a loser. Maybe it was an abusive parent or partner from you, for you. Maybe it was a bully in your life. And maybe, maybe it's still going on for you. We have all had people in life who were not gentle with us, who were rough with us. But here, in Hebrews 4 and 5, we are shown a Jesus that leads with gentleness. That's what he leads with. That's what he loves to show. He leads with restraint. He leads with tenderness. He's not surprised by your failures. He's not surprised by your sin. He doesn't love it, but he's not surprised by it. If anyone knows the depths of your sin in your heart, who would it be? It's Jesus. He created your soul. And he still stands there open-armed for you. I love this quote by the Christian neuroscientist Kurt Thompson, he said this, he said, we're all, all of us are born into the world looking for someone looking for us. And we remain in this mode of searching for the rest of our lives. A a little infant comes into the world with an instinctual looking for someone who's looking for them to open arm, accept them, to tender and gently care for them, to respond to what they're going through emotionally. And he says, it just never ends, really. Even to our men today, if you were truly honest with yourself and you could look past all the cultural expectations and definitions of masculinity that put up upon you, you too would say, yes, I just want to be accepted. I just want to have someone know it, looking for someone. I want to know there's someone looking for me. Even our men today, you're totally honest in your heart as we're all taught to be independent self-sufficient and there's some good things in that right we need each other you need someone looking out for you and men i would say you need other men in your life looking out for you you can't go it alone the culture might tell you that the culture might tell you that uh, put up as an ideal the lone ranger the john wayne figure the hero that needs no one else and that's fun to watch and it's exciting but that's not reality You need other men. You need others to open arm, to accept you and listen to you and come alongside you. I think Kurt Thompson was right. We all come into the world looking for someone just looking for us. But they haven't always been gentle people, have they? Some that have been rough with us. Who's looking for me? I'm looking for the one who's looking for me who when he finds me will love me, forgive me, and deal gently with my soul. And for all of us, there's really only truly one that can fill that role, and that's Jesus Christ. There is no one else who can really fill that for you. There's no stiff arm with Jesus. You know the Heisman Trophy? There's no stiff arm with Jesus. He doesn't do that. He's tender. He's drawn out in his heart towards those who come to him. But why? That's kind of the final thing we're going to get at today. Why? 
Why is Jesus drawn out in tenderness? If you've been here at Bethany Church anytime, you know a big proponent of the why behind things. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? Why do we do this in our service? Why do we do that? Why does Jesus deal gently with us? Verse 2 again, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he is self-beset with weakness. Referring back to the uh, human Old Testament high priest, it wasn't just enough for Aaron the high priest to go through the motions of the precise performance with the sacrifices. And if you read the book of Leviticus, which I'm kind of doing right now just for my own life, you think, why? Yeah, it's a tough one. You'll see there's lots of instructions for these sacrifices and gifts, and they were expected to get it right. There's a ton of description in there. They also needed to have the inward feeling, as we said, the feelings and heart of someone who is connected to the sacredness of this work and the neediness of the sinner making the offering. They had a job to do, and it wasn't just to cut an animal's throat and burn some, some flesh and get it out of the camp. No, they had to feel it. They had to be connected to those people. Can you imagine a high priest who looked with disgust at the people who brought the sacrifices? Or exasperation, another one? At the people who were coming in repentance? They also had to have the right heart attitude as well. And as we know, a lot of those Old Testament priests, including Aaron sometimes, actually his first job, well, we put this gold in the fire and out came this calf. (laughs) Aaron, you're the first priest. And others, his sons, we know, they didn't do well either. A lot of them didn't have the right heart attitude. They had to have the right heart attitude as well. And verse 3 tells us the earthly priest understood this attitude because he too was riddled with the same sins as the people. Just as a pastor struggles with the same temptations as the flock and congregation. King David had this heart attitude too. He knew he needed the heart attitude as well. Look at Psalm 51 when he was repenting for his greatest sin. For you will do not delight in sacrifice. So what? Yeah, there it is. Just the empty ritual doesn't mean a thing. If you did, I would give it, he says. You'll not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God, here it is, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, these you will not despise. He got it. He got it. David knew it wasn't just a ritual, it was a heart attitude. That's why, actually, the the sacrifices truly couldn't ultimately save. But you might say, well, Christ wasn't sinful, though. Right? He wasn't. He, he, he wasn't sinful, so how could he understand our plight? I think the fact that Christ never gave in to temptation actually means he understood greater than any of us the pressures of facing temptation. He never was able to let off some steam. He never gave in to it. He stood under pre- temptation his whole life. It means he understood those temptations and pressures and weaknesses and trials and suffering, I think, more than anyone else. We tend to say, well, Christ couldn't know what I went through. He never sinned. He never sinned. He never released that. He never sinned. Why is he gentle with us? Why? Because as a human, he experienced the full range and palette of emotions and experiences. He knows our heart. He knows our state. He knows our plight. You think of all the other religions of the world. They can kind of know their God. There's something about their God. But can their God really truly know them? He has no experience of them in flesh. Jesus does. 19th century Scottish pastor Andrew Murray. I'm going to read a long quote for him because he says it so well. I I love the quote because he's totally in line with our Heart of Jesus series. And I found the quote this week, and I was like, yes, that's exactly what we're doing in this series. He said this. It's two slides. It's a little long, but it's so worth it. Have we not in our faith in the priesthood of Christ been too much in the habit of looking more at his work than at his heart? He's from the 1800s, too. Have we not too exclusively put the thought of our sins in the foreground and not sufficiently realized that our weaknesses, our ignorance and errors, that for these two, a special provision has been made in him, Jesus, who is made like us, and in self encompassed with weaknesses, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest who can bear gently with the ignorant and erring? 
He says then, oh, let us take in and avail ourselves to the full wondrous message. And here it is. Jesus could not ascend the throne as priest until he'd first in the school of personal experience learned to sympathize and to bear gently with the feeblest and let our weaknesses and ignorance henceforth, instead of discouraging you and keeping us back, be the motive and the plea which lead us to come boldly to him for help who can bear gently with the ignorant and the erring. You see what he's saying there? He's basically saying what Hebrews 4 and 5 are saying. He gets it. He knows. Jesus knows our weaknesses. He knows you are but dust. He knows when you feel like a failure, what that feels like. He knows what it feels like to be covered with shame. He knows how to take you in as high priest because he's been there. He learned what it was like to be human, yet without sin. For that reason. So as the high priest, he could be sympathetic. That's his heart for you. It's our second truth today. So here's our third. If this is true about Jesus, and true about how he's handled and treated us, then as disciples, may we, should we, reflect Jesus' gentleness as a controlled strength to others. We're going to call gentleness a controlled strength. I know we started today, some of you even thought, maybe some of our men, gentleness? Gentleness isn't something we're called to be. I want to be proactive and an accomplisher and get things done. It's not actually the opposite of strength. Gentleness. We hear that, we may instantly think of it in a negative way. Weakness. As if gentle was somehow a deficit be gentle or weak in our emotions. We think it's not assertive or forceful or very impactive, and, and we discount it even though it's a fruit of the Spirit, maybe. Gentleness. We don't talk about it a lot. It doesn't get as much airtime as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, does it? It's probably the most overlooked of the fruit of the Spirit. How often do you hear someone say, I need to be more gentle? No, you never. You've probably never heard somebody say that. I need to be more gentle. I mean, as why is that? Because as a parent, you can get results. As a pastor, you can get results. In a friendship, you can get results by being assertive, brash, rough, bold. You can get results that way. But is that the kind of parent, pastor, and friend you want to be around? Probably not. And this is our temptation because it's quick, it's easy, it gets better results to not take the gentle route. You don't have to get too involved. We just deal with it. And get, you know, take it in your hand and get rough with it. It's easier. You're not, you don't have to be invested. You can bowl somebody over, or bend their will to yours. But to act, interact with someone, with a person in your life as an actual image bearer, with dignity and respect, to hear someone out, to listen well, I mean really listen to someone, and to forgive rather than lash out in anger takes a great strength, actually, of self-control that we call gentleness. It's actually a type of strength. That's the kind of parent, pastor, friend you want to be around, isn't it? That gentleness actually has to check your pride, your own emotion and temper. And the priests in the temple had to be, they needed to be, Gentle. Imagine going to the high priest with your offering. It wasn't fun. It wasn't, inter- well, I say it wasn't entertaining. It'd be interesting, I guess. Lots of blood and noisy experience. But imagine you're going there, and you're going there to reveal your weakness and your sin. The darkest part of yourself. And if the priest wasn't gentle, he could use that knowledge over you. He could be ungentle. He could ridicule you. He could blackmail you with the revealed sin. He could judge you and and shame you. He had to be a gentle guy because of that. When we first moved here, Robin was driving into Camby on Knight's Bridge, and she was pulled over, and we still had our California plates on. Ooh, I heard, I heard, oh, come on, I heard you guys, ooh, I heard that. Ooh, there is something to that. Um. Well, the officer came up to the window and told her she was, she was speeding, and she was so nervous. You've had that feeling. You see the lights in your rearview mirror. Oh, you pull over. You're nervous because it's a person in a position of authority. 
They can arrest, they can put you in handcuffs, they can give tickets, they can do all kinds of things. It's a person in authority. And the officer came to the window and uh, the kids were in the back seat at that time and he heard something and so she rolled down the windows because he's like, what's going on in the back of your car? And so she rolled the windows down and they were a lot younger then, so much noisier. And after initial discussion, he went back to his car like uh, policemen often do. Officers do when they pull you over. And Robin's mind is racing and thinking, you know, only, she's only thinking about the big fat ticket, thinking about the insurance that's going to go up because of it. And her mind is just racing there. And he comes back to the car and she sees it. He's holding a piece of paper. She's like, I knew it. I got a ticket. She, her day was ruined, she thought. She's going to be, you know, frustrated. And he comes back to the car with this piece of paper and he says, Ma'am, here I have for you stickers for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and he let her go with a gentle warning. A gentle warning. And he handed her the stickers. <laughs> you see, the beauty of gentleness and that gentle warning, the beauty and gentleness is exercised really directly correlated to the, to the strength and power of the individual when they can respond and exercise gentleness directly related to that power and authority. See, it's not weakness. It's not the opposite of strength, gentleness. Because the greater, the stronger the person, the more beautiful the gentleness is when it comes out because you know a lot of self-control was there. Now imagine Jesus on the cross. Has there ever been a person on earth more powerful than Jesus? No. More authority than Jesus? No. He'd been arrested abandoned by his friends, beaten, publicly shamed and humiliated, pushed through a sham trial, and now he hangs there being crucified, and his response is, Father, forgive them? They know not what they're doing? He could have called down legions of angels in that moment and been really rough. He could have been the sharp double-edged sword right then and destroy them all. But on the way to becoming our faithful high priest, he responds so gently. Is he weak? Is he less than a man? Is that a shameful experience or a display of Jesus there? No, it's beautiful because you see the great strength there and the self-restraint and control to respond in gentleness to those who are crucifying and mocking him. How do you think he will respond to you? Think about that moment. And it was. It was his darkest moment. It was in his darkest moment that that response and gentleness kept him from sinning in that moment, and he secured our salvation. What kind of strength would that take to ask for gentle forgiveness for your enemies while they were murdering you? A great strength. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ gives you that kind of security. The confidence to be able to be gentle, actually. What do you have to prove when Jesus is the proof of your, of your acceptance with God as your high priest? What victory do you have to ultimately really win if, if Jesus has won the greatest victory for you already? And it's yours. It's yours. Only a truly secure person in Jesus can show true gentleness because she knows the one who's been gentle with her soul, Jesus. He knows there's a high priest who's seen his darkest deeds and still gently receives him with open arms. So see again today, as we close, the heart of Jesus today as the gentle high priest who laid a graced, grace-paved path into the presence of God for you today. And go, be gentle with yourself too, but with others as well. Let me pray for us. Jesus, so many times I know our response isn't one of gentleness. We have emotions and heart inside of us that can stir, and sometimes we want to respond in anger or roughness. But Lord, gentleness is a great strength of security in you, Jesus. You must have been so secure with the Father to be able to look down at those who were crucifying you and offer gentle forgiveness. So Lord, may by the power of the gospel, may you make us gentle too. May you give us the security of knowing we can bring anything to you and we, we come as a gentle high priest who connects us to God the Father, to heaven. 
May we trust that. May we grow in that. And may that make us just a little more gentle ourselves, with ourselves, with others too. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Jeff. It, uh, it, it's, it's sometimes uh, hard to fathom just the mercy and gentleness Jesus has for us. You know, he would, he would submit himself to have for death on a cross. Even though he has all that power, he'd do that for us. Um, it's overwhelming at times. We're going to sing Good, Good Father, and in the bridge here, um, it, it says, uh, well, actually, in verse 3, it says, as you call me deeper still, and just like Adam and Eve were blocked off from the garden, you know, from original sin, and then the, the high priests in biblical times, they had a restricted way to gain access to the Holy Holy. Jesus, through his ultimate sacrifice and becoming our great high priest, restored that for us and calls us deeper still. Uh, go ahead and stand up, please. <laughs> Thank you.
And as we think about the goodness of God, here's what I want you to think about today. As we all that thought about the priest and the temple and the tabernacle, do you know you're now called the residing place of the Spirit? The temple of the Holy Spirit? Think about that. Where does heaven and earth overlap now? With you, if you're a follower of Jesus. That's pretty incredible. That's pretty amazing. Um, he goes where you go. Um, let that sink in and, and meditate on that this week. I encourage you to stick around, uh, grab some donuts, some coffee, visit. We need one another, right? We need to come alongside one another um, today as we gather out there. But before we do that, let's bless one another as we head out. May the Lord shepherd you and make you lie down in green pastures. May he restore your soul and lead you in paths of righteousness. May he be with you and comfort you. May he anoint your head with oil and bestow his goodness and mercy on you all the days of your life. We've got a couple more Sundays in this Heart of Jesus series. Hope you've been enjoying it. Love to see you back next week. Have a blessed Sunday.